So what we called this talk was the evolution of Agile, why what we've been doing won't get us where we want to go. And um, a couple of people said they've followed some of our stuff. So I'm going to, I'm going to, Start with some things that are pretty um, well trod in um, when I get out and talk. Because I think there's just like one super simple concept that, that has gotten to the point where I think about it so much and I talk about it so much, it seems so obvious to me, but I think it's like really, really hard. It's kind of like if you want to lose weight, right? Calories in, calories out. Like everybody understands it, right? Exercise more than you eat, that kind of a thing. But in real life, it's like super difficult to actually do. Right? And so, um, just real quick, this actually just got inserted in. If anybody wants access to this deck, you can text that code to that number. My marketing team set it up. And I believe that the deck will magically be sent to you or a link or something like that. So um, feel free to grab it. I'll put this back up at the end as well. And so, the, the oh, I'm sorry, my bad. Okay, cool, we'll put it back up there. So I'll just start talking. So the, the concept that, that I almost always start with, and it's a running joke in my company, Leading Agile, we actually, um, I've got a consultancy, we're over 100 people, we do large scale transformation work, um, we've been fortunate to work with like a lot of like Fortune 100 companies, so really complex systems, um, large scale software systems where there's front end, there's back end, there's platforms, right? All the things we're talking about. We're even um, working with a couple of clients right now that are, that are literally exploring how to do agile in a, like a pure play hardware environment, right? And, and what we're starting to find is that these principles even hold there as well. Okay, again, only gonna be able to like really scratch the surface on a bunch of stuff. And so this is what I call the three things. And the running joke in my company is like, it's almost like that how many degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon, right, kind of a thing. It's like when I, when I get my team like on calls, I ask them like, okay, how many hops does it take to get back to the three things, right? Because everything for me comes back to these three things. And so just really simple, it's backlogs, teams, working, tested software. And everybody goes like, oh yeah, Mike, I got it. Backlog, teams, working, tested software. Like that's, like, that's not new. I get that it's not new. But, but this is the thing that I think is interesting. If you think about the way that Agile works at the team level, and I think we can all agree that anything that you do at scale with Agile is really just lots of Agile teams working in concert with each other. Fair? Okay, so if you're not agile at the work surface level, really difficult to be agile at the enterprise level. And so, and so what I think about a lot, the way that agile fundamentally works, let's strip off all the safe stuff, let's strip off all the scrum ceremonies, let's strip off all the roles, let's strip off all the artifacts, and just think about what an agile team is at its essence. It's a group of six to eight people, that are responsible for a singular business problem that have everything and everyone necessary to deliver what's in the backlog. You guys with me? Okay. Now, the input to that team is the backlog, right? User stories, right? Backlog items. We know from the earliest days, I think one of the first books I ever read was Mike Cohn's Agile Estimating and Planning. Everybody read it? It should be required reading for everybody in this room. And it's like, okay, so you break things up. Um, he actually introduced the invest model. I think that came from Bill Wake. So independent, negotiable, valuable, estimatable, small, and testable. Right? The idea of a backlog item is that, is that you break these things up small enough so you can start to measure the rate at which you're able to complete them. Right? They're, they're written in such a way that you can do a little piece of something, then a little piece of something. Every little thing that you do adds value. And then when you decide you need to change your mind, you can pull something out and you can insert something in. Right? That's the magic of it. Right? So it starts with the backlog. And if we don't have a backlog that is written in that way. And I'll just tell you, I have a development team in my company. We work with tons of development teams. We're getting ready to launch actually like a product. Um, we're going into partnership with another group. So I work with software groups and it is like, it is so easy to put tasks in a backlog and not value in a backlog. Okay, so when we talk about the idea of a backlog being able to measure value, it's not the stuff that you do, it's the value that you produce for that customer. Okay, so what I want out of a backlog is I want them to be small items, 
but I also want to be able to estimate them so I can start to see the scope of what it is we're trying to do. Okay, now there were some questions about where does BAs come in, like why do executives want dashboards and things like that? Because at the end of the day, most organizations are not built for figure it out as you go, let's just run experiments and let's just try stuff. Right, most organizations are trying to get multiple teams to work together, they're trying to get deliverables out by a certain time, and what we want is we want some level of predictability. Where does that predictability come from? It comes from having the backlog defined, having your backlog size, and I'm good with story points, relative estimation, um, single points, flow, like, I mean, however you wanna do it, right? Um, but we want our backlog sized. We want a team that can stabilize velocity against that backlog. And I just read an article like, oh, we're way past velocity, velocity is not, well, okay. So you have to have some measure of the rate of throughput of the team. Pick your metric, right? If you don't like velocity, pick something else. But we have to have some ability to measure the production capacity of the team that we are assigning to that backlog. Because here's kind of the holy grail, right? If I can get a known backlog, and I can get a team to operate with stable throughput, and I get a ability to build something on a regular interval. Why is the build something on a regular interval so important? Because if I can't get to like a definition of done at the end of the sprint, why is potentially shippable such a thing? I don't care whether you actually ship software or not every two weeks. What I care about is, is that software in a known state at the end of that two week period. And why is that important? Because if you're building in technical defects, you're debt, you're building in defects, what you're doing is you're accumulating an indeterminate amount of work on the backside that is not measured. Okay, and so let's say we know the size of our backlog, we know the velocity of the team, we could theoretically start to anticipate scope within a fixed duration or duration with a fixed scope. You guys tracking me? on that, right? Um, the, the key is, is that when we say it's done, it's actually done. Because if it's not actually done, if there's rework, if there's refactoring, um, if there's defects that have to be put together, if there's integration work that has to be done, you don't actually know how done you are, okay? And so to some of the questions around like executive dashboards and things like that, it's like what the, what the executives at the end of the day want to understand is when is this team going to be complete with the backlog or how much of the backlog are they going to get through before they run out of time, right? That becomes the container, the crucible under which like Agile works. So I think a lot, I came from a PMP world, right? Just don't beat me up too bad over that, right? So I had my PMP for a long time, did a lot of traditional project management for a long time. So the last PMBOK I read was like PMBOK 3. Okay, I think it was five, six, seven, something like that now, right? So there's this idea there called um, progressive elaboration rolling wave planning, right? So when I talk about epic backlogs and feature backlogs and user story backlogs, like I'll talk about high level estimates that are a year, 18 months out. And then I'll talk about maybe a feature level backlog that's like three to six months out, like a release or two, right? But in that world, what I'm counting on is that I can get a release backlog ready to be able to, that tells me what I can commit to in a sprint. And then the idea is, and this is where some of the culture and, and mindset stuff comes in with the organization, is that what we have to acknowledge is that as we get deeper into that backlog, as it starts to become more like ideas, we have to have the ability to negotiate scope to deliver within time and cost constraints. Right, so the question about balancing capacity and demand is that we know that we have imperfect information about things that are much more than three, four, five sprints out. But what we have to have the ability is to converge on an outcome. We have to, make the, we have, to have the ability to make trade-offs within fixed time and cost constraints. Because that, at the end of the day, is how Agile works. We fix the team, that's the cost. We fix the duration, the sprint or the release. And what we do is we vary scope to maximize value within time and cost constraints. Okay, so I think one of the things often that we're doing wrong is we're, we're saying that it's like a management or a leadership problem or whatever, but if we're, not, if we're not thinking about these three things in a way 
that enables us to converge on business outcomes, that enables us to maximize value within time and cost constraints, and, we're, and our brain starts to go like, well, the organization just needs to trust us and just, and just help us do the best we can and give us the resources we need, and we're just gonna do the best because we're the team and we know, like, like that's just a non-starter in most organizations. Now, I know a lot of you guys work in really complex organizations. We're only talking at the team level here. If I had a single team, I wouldn't allow them to do that. But now we have multiple teams with pieces and deliverables that have to come together at reasonably the same time. Now, if I'm a lean startup, and I'm, we're doing some lean startup stuff in my company where time and cost and scope doesn't really matter because we're in experimental phases trying to figure out what our customers need and what our markets need. If we're truly experimental, that's a different game. But if you're not in that truly experimental mode and you're trying to converge on outcomes and get multiple things to sync together, right? It's like, it's like you have to play the game differently. But what I find, and again, I do, and so just over the last couple years, you know, about 12 years I've been running Leading Agile, I kind of went from like Agile coach out doing my own thing, CEO of a 160 person consultancy. So I spent a lot of time on, on sales calls, candidly. Right? And inevitably, somebody is always like, well, this isn't working, that's not working, this isn't working. Like Everybody's doing agile but not getting success from it the way they want to. It always, without fail, comes to how you architect your teams and what you structure them around, <clears throat> how you feed them backlogs, <clears throat> and if they can or cannot get to a working tested increment of software. Period. Like I mean, it's just literally just hard stop at that point. Right, because if you can't get the teams organized value around value in the right way, if you can't get the backlogs super clear and know the size of backlogs and have stable velocity, get to a working tested increment of done, then nothing in Agile works. You can have scrum masters all day long, you can have product owners all day long, you can have well-formed, like whatever, right? It all has to come together. That is to me the physics of Agile transformation. It's the physics of how Agile works. So, <clears throat> so this is the kind of like the second like idea. Okay, so you build on the three things. So one of the challenges that we have, and I heard it in some of the preamble discussion we were having, I think there's three fundamental ways that you can look at Agile in an organization. And those three ways are kind of like through a system lens, through a practices lens, and through a culture lens. And the one <clears throat> that I like to start here, because it seems like it's the place that everybody wants to start, is Agile is a cultural shift. That is true, right? But here's the interesting thing. It's my favorite question to ask when I go into user groups. As I say, if you could flip the switch and get everybody on board tomorrow, what would you have them do differently than they're doing today? They stop fighting you, they stop asking for dashboards, they stop asking for audit controls and compliance or whatever, but now you want it to work. What would you go do, right? You take culture out of the equation and now you're like, okay, like how, how would I deliver something on time? Like how would I make and meet a commitment? How would I do any of this stuff, right? And so, so I think culture feels like the problem because a lot of what we bring to our leadership creates a tremendous amount of cognitive dissonance for them. And if we can't resolve that cognitive dissonance, what happens is they go, this doesn't make sense to me. I mean, I got a lot of employees. They come to me and they'll say something. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense based upon my understanding of how our business runs. Like, I hear you. Like, I hear why you think that's important, right? I want to listen to you, but it makes no sense to me. So if somebody's, like, operating in a world where there are legit deadlines, there's investors, there's things that have to be done, there's market cycles that have to be hit, there's integrations that have to occur, right? All these different things, and you're just like, well, just trust me, and we're just going to do the best we can, and just, you just have to empower me, and we're going to push all it. Like, it gets, at some point, you have to bridge that gap. Right? And so to me, the, the culture problem is actually a manifestation of cognitive dissonance where what you're, it's what you're asking doesn't, it doesn't close the gap for people intellectually most times, okay? And so 
the hypothesis is if I could just get people to change their minds, everything else would click into place. Okay, so let's suspend disbelief. Everybody changes their minds. What are the mechanisms by which it would now click into place? Do you have a plan? I don't think most people do. Okay? The other one that I see quite a bit is the idea of a practices first. I have to like double check. Okay, cool. This is like a brand new clicker for me. I actually bought it three years ago and then didn't use it for three years. And so like, no, I don't know exactly sure how it works. So, okay, cool. <clears throat> so the next thing is like practices first transformation. So the idea behind a practices first transformation is that if I change the process you follow, I change the cadences that you do, the way you build your artifacts, right? All that kind of stuff. Then, um, then what will happen is that by changing the practices, it will expose the dysfunction in your system. And then like the scrum master comes along and fixes it or something like that. I grew up in financial services and we were dealing with 50 year old at the time, legacy mainframes. Anybody ever worked on top of a legacy mainframe COBOL platform, right? Or, or anything, right? Yeah, some <laughs> tightly integrated, poorly architected, like whatever, right? And you say, okay, I'm gonna put a scrum team on top of that mess. Okay, and you're gonna say, the team's just gonna do the best they can, they're gonna coordinate all their dependencies, they're gonna do all these things, they're gonna operate off backlogs, and they're gonna produce a working test that income never spent. Nope, they're not gonna, right? Because there's no way to deploy, there's no way to validate, everything's too tangled up, okay? So what do you do when you form that scrum team? Let's say it's even a perfect scrum team. Six to eight people, has a scrum master, has a product owner, beautiful backlogs, can't produce that working test at increment, you guys do a retrospective and the, uh, and the team decides, well, you know, we have dependencies. We're too tightly coupled. Kind of no shit, right? You kind of knew that going in, okay? So what do you do with that? That's an impediment that is critical to your success. Removing is critical to your success that, that is unable to be resolved by direct action of that team. They might not even have permission to carve out that piece of the code and put it in the cloud or do whatever, create a service around it or what have you, right? Do the product extraction work, right? And so you just know going in that there's no way Scrum's gonna work in that environment. So what starts to happen is you start to do the practices of Scrum. People like it because they're collaborating and they're making their decisions and all this kind of stuff and there's good communication and it's so it feels good, but it doesn't actually help me get to backlog teams, working tests of software, right? There's no validation at the end of the sprint. There's no measure of progress. There's no idea of when we're gonna be done. The third part that I wanna hit is, is a systems first approach. And so, so I'll, I'll go a little bit deeper and I, I have to be really careful on you talk so I don't wanna make it sound like I'm selling stuff up here, right? But it's like the approach is, is, is that you have to understand in the organization what it is that you want to organize around, and then you build the constructs, the process methodology and such around that, and then in the presence of dependencies, and this is gonna be a big topic we can't barely do justice to today, you have to orchestrate the hell out of the dependencies, and that's something that most agile methodologies do not specify. Safe does a little bit, less tends to kind of downplay it. Scrum, scrum of scrums, that's no, not gonna happen, right? And so what you have to do is you have to organize for the organization that you want, the system design that you want, and then aggressively start to do the product extraction work and the breaking of dependencies over time. Now, obviously, you don't have to do that. And you might be sitting here going like, well, I don't have the ability to go make anybody do that, right? But the reality is, is that it must be true, right? So somebody in the organization has to go build the case that if we don't get the encapsulation around the teams that we need, we're going to be forever mired in orchestration. And orchestration, just think project management, right? We're gonna be, pri and that's why you guys get project managed in the face of Agile because there's no ability for that team to get to a definition of done at the end of the sprint. Okay? What is that? <clears throat> well, so, so like one, so I'll give you like a little example. So the question was, does it break down the cognitive dissonance? Um, when, when we go in into an early stage transformation, typically the people that are like sitting in the architect's chairs, the architecture kinds of roles, tend to be the most resistant 
until you explain to them what does it mean to organize around the architecture, what does it mean to organize around services, what do you do with dependencies, all those things. And once you can communicate a path to somebody that actually makes sense, we're going to form teams, we're going to do scrum, we're going to orchestrate dependencies across teams, and then we're going to start to do the product extraction work, get the service encapsulated, and then once it's encapsulated, it can start to operate like a, like a standard scrum team. Like, that makes sense to people. They can, they, can, they can read it, right? They can see it, okay? So when you start to think about the idea of systems and practices and culture, they all work together. But I, my belief is that when you start with culture, mindset, behavior, things like that, people don't know what to go do with it. And so they want to change their mind, but that cognitive dissonance, that incongruence with the rest of their world is too great to overcome, okay? If you start with practices and you don't have teams formed right or you don't have the right culture, then that's gonna fall apart too because the practices were designed to work in an organizational architecture that doesn't exist. So what our belief about transformation is, is that you start with system design, you enable the system design with practices, you let the system design and the practices help evolve the culture, you explicitly manage dependencies until you can break dependencies. But breaking dependencies is the work of the transformation. Getting the organizational design in place is the work of the transformation. Changing people's minds and changing people's process is not the work of the transformation. That actually you almost get for free once you get the organizational design stuff right. Okay? So I'm gonna run out of time really quick. So, okay, so we'll see how it goes. So apparently I haven't forgotten how to speak in front of people. So. Um, <laughs> Okay, that's, a, that's actually good to know. <clears throat> so when you start scaling this stuff up, again, I've got decks, there's all kinds of stuff we've got online where I go deeper into this because there's actually a, an idea that I want, to, I want to introduce you to before we get out of here. And, um, and I think it's a powerful idea. Aaron will recognize it because we actually kind of invented it doing some work with his team. We actually made something that was implicit in our world very explicit, and I think it's powerful. So as we start to scale the pattern of teams, backlogs, working tested software, what it starts to scale into is net networks of teams that have relationships to each other, that are coordinated through a lightweight governance model that orchestrates requirements and dependencies across the teams, and then starts to measure not only team level metrics, but flow based metrics across the teams. So if you look at something like SAFE that a lot of people are familiar with, SAFE is built upon a very solid, what I like to call like reference architecture, right? There's a base level of scrum teams. There's coordination mechanisms that exist kind of at the program layer. There's a set of coordination mechanisms that exist at the portfolio layer, at the investment tier layer. All that stuff's super solid. Um, where sometimes I'll differ with SAFE just a little bit is the details of SAFE, the processes of SAFE are like a reference implementation, right? It's like, okay, cool. So we've taken this reference architecture. Now we're gonna enable it with processes and rules, okay? What I would suggest is that a lot of times with SAFE, in the presence of dependencies or longer range planning, you actually sometimes need to do more than SAFE prescribes. And that's probably gonna like make some people's heads totally spin, right? Because a lot of people are like, oh, safe, it's way too heavy. Um, I would say in heavily dependency-laden environments, safe is actually too light. Now here's the problem, right? Is the dependencies have to be broken if you wanna get to like really true agility at the team level. So what we wanna do is we want to manage dependencies when they exist orchestrate dependencies when they exist, but then strategically break dependencies so that the teams can operate with greater agility. So you put in compensating controls in an early stage transformation to deal with the lack of the ideal conditions, but if you stay there, you're going to have a too highly governed controlled system so you want to do the product extraction work, you want to do the encapsulation work so that you can start to deprecate some of the compensating controls, some of the orchestration costs over time. That to me is the pattern of transformation. And if I've, yeah, there you go. Okay, cool, I remembered what was in my deck, that's awesome. So the, the theory of transformation, this is kind of like the end of this little section here. 
the, the kind of the, to put the bow on this idea is that doing transformation work, getting agile into an organization in a way that's healthy and real is about figuring out patterns for how you're gonna form teams, where they're gonna get backlogs, and how they're gonna produce a working tested increment of the product. And, and if your heads are not spinning at this point, they should be, because those backlogs are really tough to come by, the teams are really difficult to form, and getting a working tested increment at the end of every sprint is really difficult. But I would suggest that it is absolutely required. So adopting Agile is about forming teams, building backlogs, having the ability to deliver working tested product on regular intervals. At scale, value-based organizational structures, the ability to orchestrate and align work across teams, and the ability to measure the flow of valuable outcomes across that network of teams and that governance model. Okay, again, it's a lot of what SAFE is trying to do, it's a lot of what LESS is trying to do, right? But it's important that you understand at that level. Um, <clears throat> and you guys said this in the early thing, Dependencies get in the way of agility, right? We know that, right? Um, one joke that I like to tell, I actually got my wife's permission. I wonder if she still actually gives it to me, but like I, or I still actually have it, it's been years. But um, one of the things I like to talk about is like, if I wanna go to a restaurant, and I'm like, like tonight, I'm in town all by myself, I wanna go across the street, get a burger, go down to a brewery, head up town, like whatever, I can do whatever I want. If I change my mind in the middle of things, I just change, right, it's fine. Right? If I was gonna have dinner with you, and we agreed and we were gonna meet, right, I'll at least have one coordination dependency. Right? If I was gonna take all of you guys out to dinner, and I changed my mind, what would happen? There's just no way, right? It's like you'd have to coordinate with everybody. But then the joke that I like to tell is when I eat dinner with my in-laws, it's four o'clock in the afternoon, it's steak, there's only like three things. Like there's no breaking a dependency with my in-laws, right? And so, so the more dependencies that you have, the less ability you have to change your mind. So dependencies are the antithesis of agility. You get more agility by breaking dependencies. And that's the thing you guys have to sit on. Form teams, build backlogs, produce working tests of software. I know you have dependencies. You have to organize as if you didn't have them and then orchestrate the hell out of them. And then the work of the transformation is breaking them over time. So creating the conditions where agile processes actually work is the work of the transformation. Not teaching people Scrum, not getting Scrum masters, not getting product owners, not doing daily standups, not doing even good development practices, right? Um, XP, you know, pair programming, continuous integration, continuous deployment, like all that stuff's necessary, but it's not sufficient. So it's like you have to build the system first. You have to understand your end state first enable it with practices that are appropriate for the level of dependencies and coordination that's in place, measure the heck out of it, understand where the dependencies are really expensive, and then break the dependencies over time. That is the work. That is what agile transformation is, right? It's not about adopting agile culture or agile practices. Those things you get for free, not free, but you know, they're not as expensive when you get the system stuff right. I'm gonna skip over a couple slides here and I'm gonna just spend a bit of time talking about this slide, okay? And, and I think we'll probably wrap it up at this point. I've got a few other slides, but they're not as important as this slide. Right, so the thing that Aaron and his team helped us get really, really explicit about over the last five years of working with Ford was the idea that what we want to do to the organization from an in-state vision, the, what I would suggest is like the operating model is wholly different than the tools that you use to get there, which is wholly different than the tools that you use to stay there, which is wholly different from how you create shared cognition across the organization. So bear with me here, okay? So can you imagine, right? So you're sitting in, in this talk with me, you have 45 minutes. Let's say you called my company and you said, hey, I heard you guys do agile transformation work, like, like what do you do? And I have 45 minutes to like explain to some C-level executive like all of this complexity, right? And they're just like, look man, I just want the easy button, like how much does it cost, how long is it gonna take, like all these different things, right? So very often what I have to do in order to get people 
to suspend disbelief long enough to hear is I break those four things out very explicitly. And this is like when I, this is kind of like the, the thing I want to talk about. It's the first time I've tried to talk about this this explicitly publicly, so I'm, I'm learning along with you guys, right? So that third column, the system of delivery. If you look at anything that you're doing with Scrum, large-scale Scrum, SAFE, Nexus, like any of these methodologies that are happening, what they're doing is that they're describing a system of delivery. What is the operating model of this organization going to look like when we are done? Right, so SAFE describes what done looks like. <clears throat> Scrum defines what a Scrum team looks like. Large-scale Scrum defines what a large-scale Scrum organization looks like. The interesting thing about methodology, and I've been studying methodology for probably over 20 years at this point, nobody's just totally making stuff up and just going like, oh, that sounds really good. I'll just put it in a book, right? Everybody has a set of experiences that they're drawing from. If I go back and I think about like Dean Leffingwell's early work on SAFE, and I've been reading his stuff since he's been writing books. Like he was a rally guy. You may remember rally. I kind of don't think it exists anymore. I guess it's CA or maybe it's, yeah. does it? Yeah. Okay. What is that? Yeah, cool. Awesome. I don't know. I, keep, I used to work for version one, so like I can't even keep up with who those guys are anymore. So um, I think they still exist, right? But I don't know. So, um, but anyway, so if you go back to like SAFE's early days, what they were basically doing is I think there was like, it was like Israel Gat and BMC and there's a bunch of different players that were going on during that world. And when Dean started writing his early revs of SAFE, what he was really doing was describing what they did successfully back at BMC, right? If you look at what like Hendrik Nieberg does with like the Spotify model, like what he's doing is he's documenting what he did at Spotify during that time with that team. Okay, so every methodology has um, value, but the question you have to ask yourself when you get exposed to a methodology is what conditions must be true for that methodology to work? So you go back to the early, um, you know, Ken Schwaber, Jeff Sutherland, and Mike Beadle work when they were describing Scrum, I guess it was at Patient Keeper or whatever some of those early case studies were. Right? They created a set of conditions under which Scrum worked. If you look at like Alistair Coburn's work and the research that he's done and the stuff he's written around Crystal Clear, there was like a way they structured team rooms. There was a way they interacted with the customers. There was a way they did all these things. And then they put methodology around it to kind of codify the practices. But there was an environment, an ecosystem that they were writing about. So the thing that we have to realize is that if we pick a methodology off the shelf, what we're doing is we're also signing up to create the conditions that were created for that methodology to work. There's nothing magic about what you learn in CSM training. The magic is how do you form the team? How do you get a product owner with the capabilities to produce that kind of backlog? Right? How do you create the technical infrastructure and discipline to be able to deliver a truly working tested increment of product? Right? It's like a lot of things. There's a tremendous amount of truth. I just actually went and bought Ken Schwaber, Mike Beadle's book, the one for like the red, yellow, green, red, yellow, green. I think it's Agile Software Development with Scrum. Because that was like one of the, the purest articulations of how Scrum works, right? From a process control perspective. Super, super brilliant work. But what starts to happen, right, is they have all this theoretical stuff. And then they go, oh, I can sell a two-day certification and charge $1,200 for it and become a millionaire, right? And I'm not questioning their, their um, you know, everyone wants to make, make a buck, right? But, but what starts to happen is then it goes mass market, and then people remember daily stand-up meetings, writing user stories, burn down charts, like all the things they prescribe, and they forget the conditions that were created in the room that made all that stuff work. So anytime you sign up for a system of delivery, a methodology, you're signing up to create the conditions that are required for that methodology to be effective. So that's one thing. So we have to know where we're going, what we want the behavioral characteristics of the system of delivery to look like, and we also have to understand what the underlying structure, governance, and metrics of that ecosystem and how they're going to behave. Okay, cool. 
So system of transformation, this was the first thing that we kind of split out. So if you hit any of our website stuff, way beyond 45 minute talk, we talk about this thing, four quadrants, and we have expeditions to base camps, ways of slicing the organizations and bringing them to intermediate states. What you have to recognize, what I think you have to recognize, my wife hates it when I tell her she has to do anything, so like I, I have to go back and go, well, I don't, you don't have to, but I strongly suggest that it might be in your best interest to actually um, take this into consideration. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm gonna get in trouble. I, this is being live streamed too, so hopefully she's not watching. So um, what you recognize is that, is that to create the conditions necessary for that system and delivery to work, you can't flip a switch and do it overnight. We all know that we would love to take our legacy monoliths and put them in the cloud, right? Take from a tightly coupled legacy COBOL platform and have it be really nicely services oriented, right? Doesn't happen overnight. Even if you had the funding, even if you had the desire, even if you had the culture change, even if you had the leadership support, it's gonna take you years to actually do it, okay? So what do the intermediate states look like as you're changing the ecosystem to go from one operating model to another operating model? Can you describe those states? Can you say what it's gonna look like in three months or six months or 12 months or 18 months or 24 months? Can you lay out that roadmap of what that change is gonna look like? What are gonna be the baby steps every couple weeks or every couple months that are gonna help us measure progress? What are we gonna actually ask people to go do to affect that change? Right? So what we've kind of learned, what was neat, it was a kind of a cool epiphany, is that we have clients that are doing all kinds of different methodologies, that have all kinds of ecosystems that they have to create. They're all based upon teams, backlogs, working tests, software structure, governance metrics, all that kind of stuff. But, but the, the patterns associated with setting intermediate milestones and doing the outcomes to actually get there and doing the work, highly repeatable. It's kind of cool, right? And so, so, Point one, right? The, the end state, the system of delivery, the ecosystem that you have to create to make the methodology work, you have to get there in a stepwise fashion. And, and one of the things I say in an, another one of the decks that I do is that agile transformation is incremental and iterative. Go figure, right? You do slices of the organization and then you bring them to progressive levels of maturity as you learn. Right? So if we think we're gonna do a big bang deployment of Agile, it never successfully works that way. It never does. You gotta slice the organization up into chunks, and then you gotta bring the chunks to progressive levels of functioning capability. So the unit of value of an Agile transformation is an organization that has been transformed. Right? So if you think about as you're building products incrementally and iteratively, you're not only adding major capabilities, but you're also refining the capabilities of the things you've already built. Right? That's what incremental and iterative development is. Right? It's always working, it's always producing the product, it's always adding value, it's always available for sale, but it's constantly being added to and constantly being revised. Defining that as a system of transformation. Here's the other interesting ironic thing. The, um, the idea that we're going to transform into an agile organization that stays static feels a little like an oxymoron to me, right? Because as markets and customers change, your systems and structures have to change. So your teaming strategies are gonna evolve, your governance strategies are gonna evolve, your business architecture is gonna evolve, your technology architecture is gonna evolve. So what you have to think about, and this is something that we've conceptualized, we haven't actually crossed the chasm with a client yet on it, is your agile transformation office, I think ultimately becomes like your office of the CIO and becomes your continuous improvement office. Right? So be mindful of that. The thing that got you there, because you know, we get this a lot, right? Oh yeah, we, don't have, we already transformed, we don't have any more appetite for transformation. But you still have to change and evolve. Do you have the ability to change and evolve to inspect and adapt your enterprise? Like there's, there's starting to be patterns that emerge, right? And then the last bit, which is I think crazy tough. And again, you can imagine me sitting in a sales cycle like trying to figure out how to explain this to somebody who's just overwhelmed, right? 
It's like a lot of times, even if I could get you to say, okay, I got the system of delivery stuff, Mike. I got the system of transformation stuff, Mike. Okay, I understand it's gonna have to evolve over time, Mike. I got it. Like, how do I get people to agree to go? Right? And there's something in, we call it a system of engagement, probably a different thing if you're in a company, but, but we've had to develop patterns for creating shared cognition across the organization. Like, how do you teach an organization reference architecture and reference implementation, come up with a playbook, come up with a pattern, instantiate something, and then pull a thread through the organization? get a working, instance of the, a working instance of the organization at a level of maturity that everybody goes, yeah, that's pretty awesome, right? And then get them to take the next thread and get them to take the next thread. And then to go, okay, I wanna improve this thread. I wanna break these dependencies. I wanna do these things, right? So, so maybe that's my challenge to you guys as I am two minutes over time here at this point. Used to be pretty good at nailing these things. So after three years of no practice, two minutes late isn't awful. So, um, so a lot of times what I suggest in, in the talks that I give is that this stuff's hard, right? I'm not saying this is like the answer, you go figure it. Like, but I think what it does is it gives you guys some buckets to go start to think about the work in, right? If you're not doing teams, backlogs, working tests of software like I talked about it, that has to start throwing flags because the practices and the culture stuff will never work in the absence of it, right? What do networks of teams, what does agile governance look like? What is the reference architecture up underneath some of these scaled approaches? And then spend some time thinking about, okay, what's the difference between my system of delivery? What are the intermediate states that I need to create? What are the patterns that I'm gonna do to get there, right? Think through your system of transformation, what that plan looks like separately. What does the system of, of continuous improvement look like? How am I gonna keep it there? Let's say we get there. Let's, how am I gonna keep it there? And then how am I going to engage the organization to create shared cognition over time and hold attention, right? We've lived this for a couple years, four or five years, and it's just like, I mean, keeping the attention of a leadership team for that long through leadership changes and all that stuff, I mean, this is what you're doing. These are like problems that don't fix overnight, and there is a progressive untangling of your org, very similar to the idea of taking a legacy monolith and moving it into the cloud. I, I, I literally think like the, the metaphor of refactoring uh, a legacy monolith, it's like, it's like what, the, what I'm talking about is refactoring an organizational monolith. Right, I think it's the same fundamental pattern. And I think a lot of approaches for the guys that are nodding their heads in the room, think about like if you're gonna take what you do in, a, in that legacy monolith and you're gonna apply it to transformational change, I think that's, that's the nut of the answer in this, right? But it's a grind, right? It's, it's hard work and it, and it takes a minute. So thank you guys for being my first talk back. Appreciate you.